Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection here on June 21st, first day of summer. First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we are going to do that which we ordinarily do, and that is read our lectionary texts for today, talk about it, pray about it, and see what the Lord might have for us. So without further ado, let me open us on a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for the many blessings that you have provided for us. Thank you, Lord that you are the God of the seasons and that as we move through the year, we do trust that you are guiding us and leading us, uh, directing our paths, Lord. Uh, keep us in obedience to you. Um, and in this heat, Lord, we do ask that you would uh, have mercy on us and uh, help those that are out in that heat today uh, to, to be safe. We thank you and praise you in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Today we're going to start with Psalm 89, verses 1 through 18. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God feared in the counsel of the holy ones, great and awesome above all that are around him? O Lord, God of hosts, who is as mighty as you, O Lord, your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you created them. Tabor and Hermon joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand, high your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exalt in your name all day long and extol your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord our King, to the Holy One of Israel. In Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11, Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, he gathers the outcasts of Israel, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds, he determines the number of the stars, he gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power, his understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Our Hebrew scripture reading today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 12 and going through verse 26. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord or for the duties of the priests to the people. When anyone offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the one who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take whatever you wish, he would say, No, you must give it now. If not, I will take it by force. 
Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for they treated the offerings of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up to, with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord repay you with children by this woman for the gift that she made to the Lord. And then they would return to their home. And the Lord took note of Hannah. She conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old. He heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If one person sins against another, someone can intercede for the sinner with the Lord. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can make intercession? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to kill them. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. And from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each of them heard, each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares that I pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our gospel text today comes from Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 40. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless, then the second, and the third married her, and so in the same way all seven died childless. Finally the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. 
and the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them are alive. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him another question. And then back to our Psalms, Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither, and all that they do they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind dri that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And our final psalm today is Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all their host by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He put the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all humankind. From where he sits enthroned, he watches all the inhabitants of the earth, he who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. A king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a vain hope for victory, and by its great might it cannot save. Truly, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. together. <laughs> okay, let's start with the Luke passage. Okay. Okay, so Jesus is addressing the Sadducees. We think about the different, um, uh, for lack of a better word, Jewish denominations that were going on. The Sadducees tended to be the uh, religious rulers in the temple area of Jerusalem. They were ones who emphasized the first five books of of the Bible as authoritative, and that's where that's that's what their focus was. And so, um, in the midst of that, then there was a difference of opinion between the scribes and the Pharisees, which believed in a resurrection, and the Sadducees, who did not, because within the first five books of the Bible, there's not a lot of indication about what resurrection would look like. Right. And so, those are spelled out in in other in other texts. And so this, uh, this question that they ask puts them in a different category than the scribes and the Pharisees because of, of this, um, the, the question of eternal life or resurrection. Mm -hmm. And so um, what we find then is a question about leveret marriage where the Pharisees obviously, I mean the, the Sadducees describe what would happen if a woman uh, marries and a man dies before they have children, then the brother of that man would have a child by that woman in order to name and after the deceased person so that that person's name would the continue. Lineage. The mm -hmm. lineage would continue. Um, and so they describe a, a really uh, extreme case where seven 
brothers had married the same woman. They all died childless. It's like, well, clearly this shows that there's no such thing as resurrection because who is she married to? And Jesus totally puts the whole thing into a different category, that our understanding of how earthly relationships work right. is very different than how heavenly relationships work, that there's, it's not just a difference in, um, in, in, in a uh, quantitative difference. It's a qualitative difference. There's something really different about eternity as opposed to time. Mm -hmm. uh, something different about uh, a resurrected life as opposed to an earthly life. Um, and so Jesus doesn't even really answer that question so much as to say marriage and that concept doesn't exist in heaven. And so uh, uh, not being married in heaven is not really, you know, who you're going to be married to in heaven is not the important question. Mm -hmm. What's important about the question is, is God the, the God of the living or of the dead? Mm -hmm. And so uh, Jesus takes it back to Moses at the burning bush, which is why he references Moses, because Moses is obviously in Exodus. It's within those five books of the Bible that the Sadducees would find to be authoritative and says God reveals himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, all who are alive and not dead. And so even proving to them from their own authoritative text um, that God has always been a God of resurrection, that even though we do die physically, that uh, our, our hope and our promise is that we will be in the presence of the Lord when we, when we pass away. Um, and so, um, you know, in the greater context of what's going on in Luke, this is while Jesus is in Jerusalem, he is confronting uh, everybody of religious significance and explaining to them that they might have some aspect that's good, but here's here's really where you've gone wrong. And, and so, uh, yeah. So I was trying to think, how does this apply? Um, and, and part of it to me is about if you do not believe in a resurrection, if you do not believe that there is life after death, uh, if this life is it, uh, then why would you not try to secure um, as many blessings on earth as you possibly could? Right. That, that you're really only going to be looking out for yourself or, or maybe for your family or whatever. Right. But it becomes something where if there are really no eternal consequences for our actions, if there's no fear of death per se and no hope for resurrection then people just live the lives you know that any anything goes anything goes, anything goes. Right. and that's where i think it jumps back to that first samuel passage because here you have the sons of eli eli was the priest at the time the temple had not yet been built the the ark of the covenant is still in the tent of meeting mm -hmm. eli is the high priest and his sons because back then the priesthood was uh, genealogically derived right. those children would follow and so the sons of eli they are priests but what are they doing? They are profaning their office. Right. There's no fear of the Lord. There's no fear of death. There's no hope of resurrection. And so what do they do? They get what they can. Every offering that comes, they take the best portions of it for themselves. They, they profane the offering. They, they sleep with the women at the tent of meeting. Um, as it says at the beginning, they're scoundrels in right. the worst sense of the word, not the Han Solo sense of the word from Star Wars. <laughs> Just have, have to throw it in there. Have to get that Scoundrel. reference. Right. And okay. so then there's a deliberate contrast set up between the sons of Eli, who are scoundrels, and Samuel, who is growing in his obedience to the Lord. Right. Now, how does that connect to everything else? Right. Right. Um, if we jump to the Acts passage, which then is Pentecost, and that is where you know the beginning of the church, the Holy Spirit comes upon the people. Um, and this is where I want to say, you know, the Old Testament, the Samuel passage, being a priest was uh, a genealogical uh, office passed on, and and here. 
um, Peter, especially in linking it to the prophet Joel, is talking about how God's spirit is going to come upon everybody that God wants to send his spirit on. Mm -hmm. He doesn't just send it upon the high and the mighty. He doesn't just send it upon right. those who are of the proper lineage or proper birth order or whatever it might happen to be. But the spirit of God is poured out upon the people, sons, daughters, young, old, slaves, men and women. Uh, they, will, they will see God, prophesy about God, uh, lead people into a right relationship with God. And so uh, what we are seeing Peter do is say this fulfillment of Joel here in the beginning of Acts is what the people of God have been waiting for. They were tired of being abused by uh, priests that were abusive. They were tired of having their sacrifices profaned. They were tired of um, people claiming to be one way and doing something different. Mm -hmm. And that expectation, that hope for a personal connection with God is being fulfilled where God's spirit is being poured out and calling everybody to a right relationship, a restored relationship, not with only God, but with each other. I hope that makes sense. I do. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm still on vacation. I'm not <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> pulling my weight over here today. It, it's okay. Oh, you you help you help me. You help me. <laughs> That's what I'm going with anyway. I'm sure that there's other connections that people can make. Um, uh, you know, one could argue, one could even go back to Samuel and talk about how Samuel becomes, uh, interestingly enough, Samuel, in Samuel's own life, he becomes, yes, the prophet, but his own children are pretty much wretches, sort of like Eli's sons were. Um, and even though Samuel himself was a faithful guy, Samuel listened to God, Samuel anointed David, uh, Samuel went on Saul first, and then Samuel did mm -hmm. anoint David. Um, but I think uh, the whole context of Samuel is even that prophetic priestly judge role is in a way ending. A kingdom is being established. Uh, ultimately from David, Jesus is then born. So that idea of a kingdom on earth, it was, it was always God's idea for a kingdom, but a kingdom in which everybody is receiving his spirit. Right. through the power of Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. So, okay. And that's fine that's if you've got questions. No, 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 that's no, 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 no. I, I don't have quite, I, I, I'm going to say something, but I'm going to, it's like it's right there. So let's see, let, we'll see. We'll see what comes out. So, okay, so as we look at these, okay, so so what? So what does that mean for us? Like, okay. Mm -hmm. But so as you look at that Samuel passage and you see these um, priests, who are taking and they are profaning the sacrifices and they are doing as, they're, as they wish. Um, you look in Acts and you hear these people that are witnessing this incredible, you know, with the actual dissension of the spirit and they're, they must be drunk. And this disbelief, um, I think, how does that speak to us? And how does that speak to, do we do these same things? You know, even in, even in our, we, we talked earlier about in lectionary discussion, what happens when our life is so wrapped up in ourselves that we don't make time for God? We, we put ourselves first. We, you know, we're like, oh, well, we don't really offer sacrifices anymore. Right, we don't offer sacrifices. We don't do burnt offerings. We don't do that. But yet... We are to give of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are to give tithes. We are to give those things. But what happens when we withhold those because we deserve those? That's the best. That's that's what we want. Mm -hmm. Or when we witness something, um, as in this, you know, this was the dissension of the spirit. This was the, you know, the spirit coming down. The tongues of fire. They're speaking in, you know, tongues and they're speaking languages. But yet everyone's understanding. I mean, like, what? And instead of recognizing this for it as an act of God, it's they must be drunk. Mm -hmm. How many times do we witness something in someone's life or witness someone's or hear someone's testimony and, and just go, whatever, mm -hmm. and discount that? And so uh, 
we may not make exactly the same mistakes that are being made through through those particular scriptures there but i think that that does play out in our lives sometimes and i think that's where as you spoke about coming back into right relationship and we don't get to have that right relationship because we have the right last name or we live in the right neighborhood or we do the right things we get to have that relationship because christ died on the cross and he did that for all of us regardless and there is in the the acts pen no not the acts passage which one maybe it is the acts passage um in the acts passage yes the um hold on now i lost my thought um no in the luke passage that's okay so in the luke passage we do have this promise of resurrection and and jesus doesn't get tied up in the details of well he doesn't try to explain away or anything he just says that doesn't exist on the other side mm -hmm. but in that he acknowledges that there is a beyond and so I think if he had tried to get down onto that level and tried to explain like nitty-gritty this that or the other he just no that doesn't exist hmm. on the other side of life resurrection that relationship doesn't exist that is over and it is changed and so which is that's a whole other interesting thing <laughs> well, <laughs> how well, does it, our it relationship is. How does our relationship change in that sense? Because obviously, our relationship with, you know, people are going to change. The marriage relationship, which is, you know, I would say you've got parent-child, you've got parent you know, or you've got um, spousal relationships. You know, that's unlike any other relationship that we have. Right. And yet, that goes away. Right. And so it just changes, you know, how does that dynamic change? That's a whole other question. We won't necessarily open that can of words unless you want to, but no, that's I, interesting. I, no, well, I, I was thinking <laughs> precisely about what you said in terms of uh, how in the world do we act, maybe, like, how do we act like false priests? And I loved how you're talking about, well, maybe with, we withhold our best. Maybe we, um, you know, only bring partial sacrifices to the Lord. You know, here there's, in the Samuel passage, obviously there were false priests that were manipulating the people, but in a way, if we don't bring our full gift, would it really even matter if there was a false priest that were accepting it? If we were just, you know, we'd be profaning it ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I loved, you're absolutely right, Jesus doesn't get into the nitty gritty of trying to answer that you know, ridiculous riddle. I mean, that's question. they're trying to yeah, yeah they're, they're trying, trying to trap him. him. They're trying to this, and he just says like, no, there's just a fundamental difference between mm -hmm. what we, what what is important on earth and should be taken seriously, but at the same time, in the resurrection, everything is made new. Everything is different. Um, being present with the Lord, um, yeah, I just. Uh, jumping it back to verse, uh, Psalm 1, and then we're going to have to close, but the Psalm 1, uh, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. You know, you've got Samuel who's doing the right thing, growing in his faith, being obedient to the God. And then you had the wicked people, the, the, the sons of Eli, and ultimately they, they perished because of their falsehood to God. They didn't take him seriously. They profaned his sacrifice. Uh, and, you know, they would live in the good life. You right. know, hey, what, free food. Yeah, but yours, hey, we're... The free ladies, you know, it's like, you know, but duh, the wicked perish. Right. The wicked perish. There is eternal life to come. Are we going to find ourselves in a place of receiving the blessings of eternal life with Jesus, or are we going to perish with the wicked? And like you said, absent Jesus doing these things for us, our tendency would be to get what you can on this earth and not worry about anything in the future. Right. But with Jesus, our eyes are open to a new reality. Our eyes are open to his love in a way that, that becomes the all-consuming um, all fire, anyway, of our lives. And um, as we all grow in our faith and as we all... Uh, experience uh, more and more of the Lord's blessing to us, um, you know, in His presence and in community with one another. Then, um, heaven, in a way, kind of becomes a reality here and now. We get blessings now and blessings mm -hmm. in the future. So, 
Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll admit, I did a little. Uh, I, I read ahead, and uh, and so. And I clearly did. <laughs> so so then this this was yeah. I, I read these, and I did have some time to think about it ahead of time. So. Uh, uh, but thank you, Natalie, for being a good sport and <laughs> jumping. <laughs> I was so afraid you were going to ask me to take the lead. <laughs> Welcome back from vacation. Glad you're here. Glad and, to uh, be here. It was good. Right. It was so, good. You want to go ahead and close this in prayer? I'd be happy That'd be to. great. Thank you. Gracious and loving Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that it is poured out upon us freely and that it is not withheld and it is not um, set aside for just the certain few, the chosen few. It is set aside for your children and that we um, can come into relationship with you and embrace that relationship and embrace you and love you and live into uh, what you call us to do and to live the lives that you call us to live, um, growing in our faith and our um, obedience to you. I just pray that you Help us to open our hearts and open our eyes to see you in in our lives and in that come to know you and to love you and and um, continue to be obedient to you and, and uh, work towards growing into that right relationship with you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks everybody for joining us. Hope you all have a great day. Blessings to you. Bye-bye.